history sometimes repeats itself. And that now seems to be the case with subprime loans, which Michael Burry has now called out. Michael Burry, of course, has quite a lot of experience with this. He's most famous for the big short, where he bet against lenders that were making these risky subprime loans. But in a tweet, Michael Burry specifically called attention to Goldman Sachs' consumer credit practices. Michael Burry states, Goldman keeps stepping in it. AIG was rescued to save Goldman from the other subprime issue that everyone swore would not be contagious. That is risky subprime mortgages. Goldman's Apple Card? More than a quarter to subprime borrowers. 3% loss rate on that business as of quarter two. Michael Burry then links to a CNBC article that I'll go over in just a second. But Michael Burry's comments here aren't just about Goldman Sachs. It's not just about Apple Pay. Indeed, we can draw parallels to buy now, pay later. We've seen many buy now, pay later providers see their valuations or their share prices slashed. Klarna recently saw its valuation go down 85%. Zip, Sezzle, many other buy now, pay later providers have also seen their share prices decline precipitously. They're also facing mounting losses which is very reminiscent of what Michael Burry is saying in this tweet. Furthermore, in the mortgage sector, we're seeing some companies like Bank of America also potentially doing some more risky loans, which is something I'll be going over in this video. Nevertheless, if you have any thoughts about what is going on with these bad debts, about whether there's more risky lending, about whether the bailouts in the global financial crisis exacerbated this issue, I would be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Let's start off by looking at the article that Michael Burry linked to. Now this, of course, is in CNBC, and it's an article by Hugh Son. The article is titled, Goldman's Apple Card Business Has a Surprising Subprime Problem. The key points are, Goldman's loss rate on credit cards is the worst among US card issuers, and well above subprime lenders, at 2.93%, according to a September 6th note from JP Morgan. More than a quarter of Goldman's card loans have gone to customers with a FICO score below 660 according to the company's filings. That could expose the bank to higher losses if the economy experiences a downturn, as expected by many forecasters. The article is itself quite detailed, and I'll only go through some excerpts of what it says. The article states, After the 2008 financial crisis, caused by undisciplined lending, most banks shifted towards serving the well-off, and competitors including JP Morgan and Bank of America tend to focus on higher-end borrowers. The exception is banks such as Capital One, which focuses on subprime offerings after buying HSBC's US card business in 2011. Capital One says that 30% of its loans were to customers with FICO scores below 660, a bond that contains near prime and subprime users. That's within spitting distance of Goldman's proportion of sub 660 customers, which was 28% as of June. Meanwhile, JP Morgan said that 12% of its loans were to users with below 660 FICO scores. And Bank of America said that 3.7% of its loans were tied to people with FICO scores under 620. After a period in which borrowers, fortified by COVID stimulus checks, repaid debts like never before, it's the industry's newer entrants that are showing much faster weakening in their credit metrics, the JP Morgan analyst Vivek Jujeja said last week. Goldman's credit card net charge-off ratio has risen sharply in the past three quarters, he wrote. That is happening despite unemployment remaining relatively low at 3.7% in August, similar to 2019 levels. The article then specifically addresses what's going on with Goldman's Apple Pay situation. That has forced the bank to set aside more reserves for potential future credit losses. The consumer business is on track to lose $1.2 billion this year, according to internal projections, which Bloomberg reported in June. The vast majority of the consumer investments this year are tied to building loan reserves, thanks in part to new regulations that force banks to front-load their loss reserves, Solomon said to analysts in July. That's very reminiscent of what happened with JP Morgan, where JP Morgan saw its loan loss reserves have to increase significantly. So Goldman is facing a similar issue to what's going on in the industry. The figure could get worse if a recession forces them to set aside more money for SARD loans. The difficulties seem to confirm some skepticism that Goldman faced when it beat other established card players to win the Apple Card account in 2019. Rivals said the bank would struggle to reach profitability on the no-fee card. So this article, of course, is highlighting that many of these credit cards are going to relatively more risky borrowers, particularly with more nascent entries into the sector. Now, Michael Burry was specifically highlighting what's going on in the credit card industry. However, the credit card industry is not alone. 
the buy now pay later industry has its own issues. So if we focus on buy now pay later, we can see what's going on here. Klarna, for example, saw its valuation go down 85% in its latest round. It did what's called a down round, whereby VC funds are basically investing at a lower valuation than they did last round. This typically occurs if the company has either gotten worse, it needs desperate money because it's very cash strapped, and or conditions have deteriorated for the company, which is why we're seeing many down rounds in the VC industry at the moment. So Klarna, for example, has seen its losses triple over the past year. That is catastrophically bad and accounts for this decline in valuation. But Klarna is not alone. Other buy now pay later providers have seen share prices decline precipitously. Zip, for example, has seen its share price almost drop off the edge of a cliff. Similarly with Sezzle. Now Zip CEO, I have a lot of respect for. Larry Diamond is a very skilled operator. However, this doesn't save Zip from the broader downturn in the sector. Zip, for example, had a billion dollars worth of losses. To be fair, much of this was them prudently taking account for bad debts. And that does account for the vast majority of this loss, i.e. its provisions as opposed to necessarily losing money per se. But it still is a negative sign. It tells us that credit quality might decline. And in fact, for Zip, we're seeing a worsening in their bad debts situation. So according to an article by Kerry Sun, bad debts in the US increased to 2.7% of total transaction volumes in the June quarter, up from 2.6% in the first half of 2022, and around 1% a year ago. Management reaffirmed to investors that continued tuning and optimization will see losses below the target of 2% by the end of the calendar year, at least hopefully. The bad debt narrative was worse in Australia and New Zealand, up to 3.82% for the quarter, compared to 3.4% in the March quarter and 1.82% a year ago. Again, management tried to reassure investors the losses have peaked in Australia and New Zealand, and arrears roll rates, a forward indicator of losses, are trending down in financial year 2023. There was no comment about losses for the rest of the world. In essence, the buy now pay later sector is facing some significant headwinds. Bloomberg has also reported that people are using buy now pay later to pay for groceries. A pair of LinkedIn polls by UNSW, a university in Australia, helped to echo this. UNSW asked the broader LinkedIn community, has cost of living got you thinking about buy now pay later? 22% of people said yes, 78% of people said no. So only a minority of people are thinking about using buy now pay later more than they were beforehand, but it still is a sizable chunk of people, and it does raise some concerns. UNSW Business School also asked what would normally be a more business orientated community. Cost of living, will buy now pay later use rise? 59% of people said yes, 28% of people said no, and 13% of people said it's too early to tell. This tells us bad debts could actually get worse. Because if people are using buy now pay later to pay for groceries, they're potentially getting more and more cash strapped. Either more cash strapped because wages aren't increasing in real terms, or maybe their mortgage rate has gone up depending upon the location, whether they have a fixed rate or a variable rate. So people perhaps have less disposable income than they once did. Hence using buy now pay later to pay for staples. That doesn't bode well for future credit quality. So therefore it seems some of these losses could potentially get worse. They could potentially get much worse if we're going into a significant and severe recession. Now, what about mortgages? Surely mortgages are immune from this subprime issue. Surely the banks learned from the global financial crisis and are not making risky loans anymore. Well, it's not so easy. It does appear the banks are making some potentially risky loans. And in particular, we're seeing companies like Bank of America do some of this. So according to an article in CNBC by Laurie Conish, Bank of America launches zero down payment mortgages to help minorities buy their first homes. Bank of America is launching a zero down payment, zero closing cost mortgage products to help members of predominantly minority communities buy their first homes. The program, called Community Affordable Loan Solutions, will be available in certain cities including black and or Hispanic neighborhoods. Eligibility is based on income and home location. No minimum credit score or mortgage insurance is required. So here, in essence, we're going back to a situation where no deposit is required to buy a property. Now, this isn't quite as bad as we saw in the financial crisis. In the financial crisis, we basically had ninja loans where people didn't have a job or any real tangible income, or the income was quite uncertain. Here, it does appear Bank of America is assessing people based on their income. However, there are still significantly more risks 
then you and you require someone to have a deposit. If you require someone to have a deposit, then they've borrowed less as a proportion of the property's value. If there's no deposit, then the bank has significantly more risk. So if we consider a million dollar property, suppose that property is worth a million dollars right now, but then there's a housing market downturn and it goes down, we'll go with 30%, to $700,000. If a person put down a deposit, then that person has borrowed less money. So therefore the bank is at less risk of a loss. So if they put down a 20% deposit, they only borrowed 800K. So now the bank loses 100K on this. They go and foreclose on the property, they sell the property for 700K, they lent 800, so they're out of pocket 100. However, if the bank lent the full million dollars, the bank is now out of pocket $300,000. Because they lent a million, they can only recoup 700,000, means they have a loss of 300K. That, of course, is a major issue. Because when we're facing a situation where property prices could go down, we're hearing talks about a housing market crash, so to speak. We're hearing issues of interest rates going up significantly, and in areas that are not supply constrained, property prices probably will decline. In addition, those people who might have had good jobs might lose their job, particularly if unemployment goes up. So some of these people who don't have a credit rating, because that doesn't appear to be required, who might have had a stable job, might lose that job and therefore not be able to repay. When we add on to this the fact that the lower credit rating borrowers are the ones who are more likely to default, potentially giving rise to more losses for these lenders, these banks are taking on a lot more risk. It isn't as bad as what happened in 2008, but it certainly is risky. So in short, Michael Borry has a very good point about what's going on with subprime loans really re-emerging across multiple sectors, whether it's credit cards, buy now, pay later, or mortgages. We're seeing more risky loans coming to the market as banks seemingly are trying to earn more money from doing these products. What then are the financial implications of this? Well, you could be super risk loving and decide to do what Michael Burry did during the global financial crisis and just short these financial institutions. That, however, conveys a lot of risk and is not necessarily something I would advocate. It conveys a lot of risk because the market can remain wrong longer than you can remain solvent. Furthermore, quite a lot of this downside appears to be priced in, particularly with buy now, pay later providers, given that we've seen their share prices plummet significantly. However, we can draw some insights into how you would scrutinize financial institutions when analyzing, if at all, you want to invest in these firms. In particular, we want to look at a few things. You're going to want to look at their non-performing loans ratio, i.e. how many loans are actually being repaid and how many are being quite late. And therefore, what is the likelihood this firm will not be able to recover on the things that is lent out? Also, you want to look at the CET ratio and in general, any capital adequacy ratio the firm has, because this will help to indicate how well the bank can weather a financial downturn. That is, if its borrowers stop being able to repay its debt, is the bank going to become insolvent? Is it going to face major issues? Or is it going to be able to muddle along as it did before? We saw during the financial crisis, the banks that were relatively more capitalized were able to outperform significantly those that had much worse capital adequacy ratios. And you'll also want to look at the broader macroeconomic environment in which the bank finds itself. Is the bank going to be exposed to significant losses due to where it is lending? Or is the bank potentially in a more stable area that is going to be less exposed? Furthermore, banks don't appear to be doing particularly well at the moment. While interest rates have increased and banks are charging more to lend out money, there's less demand for borrowing people aren't buying as much in the form of housing. Hence why these banks seem to be doing some more risky loans. So people aren't borrowing as much to go out and buy a house because interest rates have increased, which makes it relatively more unattractive. I.e., you might be getting more money per loan, but there are fewer loans being done. Not only that, banks often borrow short and lend long. That is, they're lending in 30-year fixed rate mortgages, but they often need to get short-term debt. And as the yield curve has steepened, the relative benefit of doing this has decreased a little bit because the relative benefit of borrowing short and lending long has gone down somewhat. Hence why we're seeing some of these banks not doing particularly well stock price-wise throughout 2022. And hence why it's often worthwhile being cautious before investing in these financials. And in case, I hope that gives you a bit of an idea about what Michael Burry is saying, particularly about subprime loans, and about how this relates to consumer credit and buy now pay later companies and also mortgages. 
and also some of the investment implications one might draw from this, and how this might influence whether or not you decide to invest in bank stocks. Now, if you have any thoughts about what is going on with these loans, about whether risky loans are magnifying and increasing significantly, I would be interested to hear that in the comments below. And otherwise, of course, it would be great if you liked the video and subscribed to the channel. And hopefully I will see you for future videos as well.